okay i think uh, it's time for us to make a start um may i first of all say good morning to everybody in europe and uh, good day to all of you wherever you may be viewing from any part of the world today it's great to see you all here and to have you on this uh, most important meeting of uh, the UFA and ASPA um, health health and health healthy youth health literacy uh, for youth uh, here today and um, my name is John Middleton I'm the uh, 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 president of the uh, Association of Schools of Public Health in the European region um, and it's my great pleasure to be co-hosting this meeting with uh, you for today. Um, my uh, uh, first duty is to uh, say uh, in terms of housekeeping the if you will stay on mute until you're uh, invited to speak or uh, to um, uh, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to post please put them in the chat or uh, in the question and answer um, I would uh, just like to introduce this session by saying that uh, um, a healthy and health literate youth is what we're here to discuss uh, in the recent uh, Eurobarometer study um, the younger people of Europe said that their two biggest expectations uh, were that 72% said uh, that they wanted decision makers to listen to what they had to say and to act on them. Um, and 71% uh, also uh, sought uh, better personal, social uh, and professional development and uh, this session will combine both uh, the health of young people uh, and also the health and expectations uh, and aspirations of our young professionals in public health. So uh, without uh, any further ado I would like to hand over to uh, Iveta Nagyatiova uh, from uh, president of the European U uh, Public Health Association uh, and she's going to introduce our keynote speakers. Thank you. Iveta. Thank you very much, John. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the UFA, I also would like to cordially greet you at the kickoff event of the European Public Health Week 2022. This is the fourth edition of the European Public Health Week and we are pleased to see its growing popularity. This year, we have a new record of events organized, 235 events in 21 languages from 32 countries, European countries, but also outside Europe, Colombia, Israel, and United States of America. As you may already know, each day of the European Public Health Week is dedicated to a different topic and co-organized by a different main partner. And as already John mentioned, the today's topic is a healthy and health literate youth. Association of the Schools of Public Health in the European region, ASFER, is the main partner. And again, without further ado, I would like to introduce you the first speaker, Natasha, Dr. Natasha azubardi Muska. Director of the Division of Country Health Policies and Systems from the WHO Regional Office for Europe. Natasha is also a former president of the UFA and a dear friend. Natasha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear Iveta, dear John. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone who is with us. And it uh, does not bear repeating that this is an event which is very close to my heart. I can't believe that it was already three years ago that we started off with the first edition. And today what I would like to say is that now more than ever, we need to continue to focus our efforts to build capacity in public health, in the current and the future public health workforce. But I'm also very heartened by the topics that you have chosen to focus the activities of the entire week, starting with today with the emphasis on youth. So looking forward, it's important now that we are emerging from the acute phase of the COVID pandemic, that we do not let for one minute the focus from public health ebb away. 
And in order to do this, whilst continuing to focus our efforts on preparedness for the next health threat when it comes, whilst we are already in the European region, facing another crisis, the crisis of war, a crisis which comes on top of a crisis. And actually our regional director, Dr. Hans Kluge, who conveys his best wishes to all the public health community, is actually this morning in Ukraine. And of course, against all this background, we need to continue to intensify our efforts to build back better. But what does build back better mean? The effects of the COVID pandemic, the long lasting effects are only beginning to emerge. When we launched our European health report in February of this year, we took a snapshot of the emerging impacts of the COVID pandemic. And we find that whilst these are only yet beginning to be understood, the full impact is likely to become visible in the months and years to come. And therefore, when we look forward, we need to focus on rebuilding and refitting our health systems to ensure that they can cope with the backlog of disrupted services, but also with the new needs that have emerged. And we need to focus very much on helping our population to lead healthy and fulfilled lives. And this includes, for example, a focus also on risk factors we saw quite a great deal of backsliding during the pandemic, even, for example, when it comes to uh, factors such as obesity. And again, last week, we issued a report on obesity, which had some very sobering results. Allow me just a couple of words on the main topic of today, which is the health literacy of young people. And here specifically, I would like to focus on mental health. We know that young people were particularly hard hit during the pandemic, with many of them suffering from bouts of anxiety and depression. And today, all over the European region, the silver lining is a high level political recognition of the need to invest in mental health and young well-being, particularly that of young people. And here we are working very closely at the regional office in Copenhagen, where we last week had the first meeting of the pan-European mental health coalition, which was addressed by a young activist, Ben Ogden, who himself actually suffered from mental health problems and took to social media to encourage people like himself to speak out, to know where to reach out. We have launched a new program on the mental health of adolescents and young people in our Office on Quality of Care in Greece, because we know that our mental health services need to continue to reinvent themselves, to adapt, to ensure that they meet the needs of young people. And thirdly, with our office in Venice, um, focusing on investment and health and development, we have prioritized the mental health and well-being of young people, particularly young people who are most at risk of being socially excluded, young people who at the moment may be struggling even to find a job to continue with their education because we have to acknowledge that the economic and social climate in the European region in the wake of the past two years is really a very difficult one. And as a public health workforce, it is our duty and responsibility to continue to shine a light on the emerging evidence to ensure that there are the necessary information systems using also the innovation through digitalization and big data to ensure that we do have the evidence that we need and to raise our voices to be at the table where the decision makers are not only health decision makers, but even decision makers from other arenas to go forward. I think my time is up, Iveta, so I will hand over back to you. I know you have several interesting speakers lined up for this morning's first session. And thank you as always for asking me to join. Dear Natasha, thank you very much for your welcome address on behalf of the WHO Europe. And also not only the welcome address, but actually also highlighting a lot of very important and very relevant topics, including preparedness for uh, next health threats or rebuilding and innovating our health systems or uh, the 
uh, the importance of high level political recognition of today's uh, topic. So just to highlight a few of them, thank you very much. And I'm sure that it will very much resonate among, among other participants. And now I would like to introduce you another dear friend of the UFA, Dr. Isabel de la Mata, the principal advisor for health and crisis management at the European Commission. And this will be a welcome address on behalf of the European Commission, Isabel. Thank you very much, Iveta. Good morning, everybody, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is an important week that begins today, um, recognizing the importance of public health uh, in Europe and in the world. Um, the, the last two years have put uh, public health uh, in, the, in the minds of everybody. Uh, worldwide, people have been aware of the importance that uh, public health has and that if we haven't dedicated uh, in, the, in the previous year, in general, uh, enough uh, budget, enough attention, we always say that only 3% of the health budget is dedicated to public health. So that uh, this is something that we need to correct and that is important that we invest uh, in uh, public health because the preparedness, the response is important for the health of the world. Uh, the topics of this week uh, are very important in general for the, for the European Union. Uh, during the last two years, we have been embarked in this fight against COVID, uh, something that uh, at the end uh, is beginning to be won thanks uh, to the surveillance, to the preparedness and response, but also uh, through the, the vaccination. And that, that will be the topic of tomorrow. When uh, we began to think that we have uh, won this fight and that we will be back to normal, the recent uh, war in Ukraine uh, has uh, also impacted the health of millions of uh, European citizens and is something that we also are concentrating in, in fighting. All those last uh, years have uh, had an impact on the mental health of the population. We have seen uh, the, uh, how an, an event that is not only health related uh, has uh, uh, also an impact uh, on the health of the citizens and uh, how we need to respond in areas where we are not so prepared. The, the health services have been really impacted. Uh, they couldn't dedicate uh, their efforts uh, to what they were doing normally, but we needed to concentrate in emerging issues that sometimes left unattended other important ones. Uh, we need to reverse that, but at the same time, we have seen that the uh, health services have been resilient, need to be more resilient, but we are working on that. The climate is, uh, I mean, we have seen the, the impact uh, of the climate change in, the, in our health, how everything now is related, what we have called the, the one health, and how we need to to work not only on the human health, but also in, in the food, in the animal, in the, in the planet health in general. The European Union has declared the 2022 the European Year of Youth as a recognition of the sacrifices that the young people have made during the pandemic. And it's an important milestone in acknowledging the young people's uh, expectations, rights, and needs. Also, as has been said, to have uh, the young people literate in, in health could help not only them, but also the rest of the, of the population, the rest of the world, uh, to have better health habits, better response, and better preparedness for everything. So thank you very much for having invited the European Commission to be present with you in this first day. And also we will be in some of the events during the, the week. And I hope this is a very successful week that puts, uh, again, uh, health and public health, and not for the worst, but for the, for the best in the minds and in the scene of uh, the whole uh, Europe. Thank you very much, Iveta. Back to you. Thank you very much, Isabel. It's always such a great pleasure to collaborate with you and the European Commission. And again, thank you very much also for reminding us about COVID-19 and all the consequences that it brought about. Indeed, it came as an unfortunate reminder of the importance of global health, the social, political, and economic future of humanity, 
with many consequences, including, for example, as you mentioned, disruption of essential health services, increased risk of excess illness from, and death from non-communicable diseases, mental health deterioration, health workforce burnout, and also not meeting on slowing down considerably achievements is the SDGs. And we are really pleased uh, to collaborate together with the European Commission as UFA, but I believe that also ASFER and other partners to move on and to bring and to build more resilient uh, healthcare systems and societies. Once again, thank you very much, Isabel. And now, John, back to you or over to you. Okay, thank you very much uh, to both our uh, opening speakers. And uh, we'll move swiftly on. This first session is very much about the health and health literacy of young people and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Christine, Christina Sorensen, uh, founder of the Global Health Literacy uh, Academy. Uh, Christina, straight over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you and good morning everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, open this first day of the European Public Health Week. Uh, I have a bit of a cold but I do hope that you can hear me um, when I was a student in the 90s, uh, the Berlin Wall fell and shortly after the new borders in Eastern Europe, was, uh, they were created. And today, 30 years later, we see that these borders are questioned or even jeopardized. And as European citizens, we have faced many changes during our history and borders being one of them. But while change might be a constant factor uh, in Europe, we have also taken steps to show that borders can lose their values when we consider free movement uh, of people and goods, as well as public health matters. Borders are in the minds of people and how we interpret them are up to us and how we cooperate is up to us. And I want to highlight here EU's youth strategy, uh, which is a youth policy cooperation for 2019 to 2027. Um, it has three core areas of actions, engage, connect, and network. Um, and while barriers still exist, there are more and more opportunities for young people to engage in society. I live in Denmark, I'm Danish, and uh, in Denmark, outside the Copenhagen and the harbor, we have a youth island where young people are given the power to organize its activities. And we can be connected online and offline and make friends all over the world and we can study and work from a distance as well as on the ground and new opportunity new opportunities arise all the time to connect locally and globally young people today are empowered to take part in policy and society and it was such a pleasure the other day to meet a young um, uh, member of our city council here in Aarhus, where I live. She's 22 years old. She's one of the youngest members of the city council, but she was so engaged. And she was telling me how much she has already influenced the policy agenda here. So it's possible. However, some societies foster better engagement than others. And engagement requires that we open the circles of power to young people. Uh, that would not previously be possible to take part in. And it means we have to create initiatives where young people can engage on their conditions and where they feel safe. And fostering the health, healthy and health literate youth requires that we invest in health and well-being of all. As uh, the previous speakers mentioned, we are faced with increasing youth rates of mental illness, suicides and accidents. And we can do so much more to support children and adolescents in schools through targeted efforts. But actions should cover all aspects of health, physical, social, mental, emotional, sexual, spiritual, financial and digital health. Health literacy covers functional, interactive and critical health literacy. And knowledge about diseases, health and well-being is important to take appropriate actions to keep ourselves and those around us healthy. Interactive health literacy support young people in engaging actively in health matters that concerns them. And lastly, critical health literacy increases their opportunity to be part of decision making and influence the conditions uh, of health and well being. I'm so pleased for the time being to work with students on planetary health literacy uh, to see what knowledge and skills are needed for us to protect the health of people and planet in the future. In most European countries, one in four does not have the health literacy to find, understand, appraise and apply information to 
make informed decisions and manage health. We must ensure that people with limited health literacy are not victimized. Health literacy is an asset, an asset that can strengthen quality of lives. Thank you everyone here for facing this challenge and be the change that we need to create a, a better future. Thank you. Over to you, John. The day is open. Thank you very much, Christina, and uh, for that wide ranging introduction to the uh, issues that face us with uh, improving the health and quality of life of young people. Uh, you use the word asset, which is a very uh, uh, vital one in public health. We tend to talk in terms of deficits, but we need to talk about young people as an asset and health as an asset. And th thank you for that introduction. Um, now it's uh, time for us to go to Anna Radone in, uh, in uh, Pavia in Italy uh, with her friends Leo and Julia who've uh, accompanied us through the uh, pandemic and uh, their latest uh, expo exploits are uh, about to be uh, given to us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I must admit it is a great pleasure to be at the kickoff of this important European Public Health Week to discuss with you all on a topic which is health literacy of young generation, which is very, very close to my heart and mind. Um, together with uh, public health colleagues and in collaboration with the ministries of health and international institutions, including uh, UFA and ASFER, we've been working hard in the last two years to develop a health promotion program that talks, that targets children, which is very innovative, but there is strong evidence that it's never too early to start teaching kids about public health. What we do in class at the university, we want to do early in life. And there is evidence that that works to improve health and well-being in young generation, but also in adults to be. I would like to show you, I think it's already on screen, Leo and Julia, which is an animated cartoon series that we have developed to teach children about public health. This episode that uh, we are launching uh, now and we are sharing with the wider European public health community aims to teach children how vaccines work, what is herd immunity, all those concepts that we have challenges in teaching adults and that are so important as we saw during the pandemic. So four minutes to show you this second episode of Leo and Julia and get your impressions about these two little funny siblings, Leo and Julia. Leo and Julia, us just, just like, like you. Julia, hurry up or we'll be late. How come you're always late for school? I love it. That's the spirit, Leo. And it's much safer now that more and more people have been vaccinated against coronavirus. Um, excuse me, Julia. Everybody's talking about it, but what is a vaccine? Vaccines are like medicines that protect us from diseases caused by certain germs that are our enemies, like coronavirus called vaccines because they were discovered more than 200 years ago by an English physician, Dr. Jenner, who was studying how a disease that affected cows might protect humans. They should have called them cows. <laughs> Come on, Leo. You know the Latin for cow is vaca. That's why they're called vaccines. Thanks to Dr. Jenner, even a terrible disease like smallpox was defeated wiped off the face of the earth. Awesome. Then what happened? Then many other vaccines were discovered, each one specifically for a different disease. You were vaccinated against many diseases when you were little, and so you're protected and not at risk of falling ill. Right, but how do they work? 
How do they protect us against coronavirus and defeat it? The vaccine gives our immune system precise instructions for fighting the virus. When the vaccine enters our bodies, it explains the whole nine yards on the enemies it has to fight and what they're made of, so our bodies are ready to recognize them. Thanks to the information contained in the vaccine, our immune defenses learn how to recognize the enemy. <laughs> So, when coronavirus enters our bodies and tries to make someone who's vaccinated ill, it can't do it. Our bodies are ready to recognize the enemy, and when they see it, they attack it in a targeted way. They destroy it and weaken it. Ah, oh, now I understand. There's another important thing you should know. The more people who get vaccinated, the more we are protected, and the spread of the virus is contained. It becomes harder for the virus to move around and attack other people. So we protect everyone, even the most fragile. This is called herd immunity. That's why it's so important to vaccinate the greatest number of people possible. So we will beat the virus all working together. Great, Julia, you're awesome! We will win all working together. Bye-bye, sis. <laughs> hey, what? Leo! 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 Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, we love Leo and Julia, so uh, maybe there'll be another instalment in the future, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, people uh, on the call, we've got uh, a YouTube link there in the chat that uh, Anna has posted. If you'd like to uh, have another look or uh, send Anna any uh, feedback on the, uh, on the film. Let's... Um, Thank you for that, Anna, and let's move swiftly to Rosie Nash, the other side of the planet. Uh, big welcome to you, Rosie, and thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, please tell us about uh, improving health and educational outcomes for children in sustainable ways. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, so um, I'm a senior lecturer in public health at the University of Tasmania, which is in Australia. And today I'm presenting um, about Health Lit for Kids on behalf of my amazing team. Um, we, um, so I come from a background of 20 years as a pharmacist and we co-founded Health Lit for Kids in 2016. Since we've also established our Health Literacy and Equity Research Group in 2019. And currently we have 10 PhD candidates contributing to health literacy research in Tasmania, including uh, a lot of the work um, being focused on children and, and young people. And we're currently working on establishing a social enterprise called Health Lit for Everyone. And I'll come to that towards the end of the presentation. Um, so if we move to our next slide. Um, so what is Health Lit for Kids? Well, as I said, it was founded in 2016 and it responds to what we recognise to be an important gap in the delivery of health literacy programs for communities and schools. And we work at a local level with our children, their schools, families and communities. And um, we seek to co-design and develop new approaches to learning and health. So we sought to address a local need and we recognise that Tasmanians have some significant health literacy challenges. Um, we have poor health outcomes and also some um, significant educational attainment challenges um, compared to the national average. And we knew deep down that health literacy um, was going to be part of the solution. And that as um, I'd have to agree with Anna, starting earlier in the life course would be part of that solution. So we started working with our primary school um, 
uh, um, sector. So if we move to the next slide, what I wanted to highlight to you today was the outcomes or impact of our program so far. So Health Lit for Kids has been really fortunate to receive local, national and international recognition. And we've been published now in three World Health Organization reports. We've um, evaluated our work and had that uh, presented in 11 academic papers in book chapters. And also we've received five awards and we've presented to many local, national and international conferences. And I'd like to say um, thank you for having me today to, to help open up this session as well. Um, and it's lovely to see some of my familiar European friends um, on the call as well. So our team is quite multidisciplinary and we have grown rapidly um, to include practitioners and researchers from now seven universities across Australia. Um, so in the five schools that we've worked with, we've touched 132 teachers, 1,725 students, and approximately double that number, number of family members and the wider community. And many of those people said to us they weren't aware of the concept of health literacy previously. Um, and as you'll see as I'm unpacking our key findings, that's now um, not the case. We've also had over 12,000 people visit our website since it was launched in 2018. And again, this is evidence of our reach and impact beyond our five participating schools. So our research outcomes, as I said, have been published in a number of peer reviewed journals. Um, and our key findings to date include a number of things. So the first is that our teachers um, have described to us an improvement in their health literacy, knowledge, skills and experience. Um, as a result of their um, participation in our professional development workshops. We've also had increased teacher confidence um, and that was captured in the evaluation from our teachers. The teachers also reflected at the conclusion of the first year of the program and they confirmed to us how important it is to take a whole of school approach and also the need for teacher professional development. So they felt that perhaps an understanding of what health literacy was, but also the best pedagogies to um, deliver health literacy and support the development of health literacy in their children was also very important. And the teachers also described to us an amazing high student engagement um, across the school and this idea of a shared new health language school-wide. So that was observed um, in all five of our schools. Our parents' um, perceptions were also captured through focus groups and a lot of their um, observations were, were reinforced what the teachers had said. And in particular, they felt that the, the student engagement was very high and many of them noted that their children's behaviour changed um, and they were keen to make sure that for future iterations of the program, parents were engaged in the program. We also captured the school leaders or our principals' insights. And so um, at six and 12 months after our implementation year, and they gave us some amazing insights into how we could make the program more sustainable and scalable. And I will come to some of those points in a moment. Students were then also invited to develop or evidence their health literacy development through artifacts, so creative pieces, and teacher written reflections were also captured. All of these pieces of data helped us to see this student behaviour change um, through both the parents and the teachers' perspectives. We also were able to help teachers to think about their school as a health literacy responsive environment or organisation. And the teachers used um, an existing tool, almost like a checklist, to help them see how they could make their school more health literacy responsive. And then finally, the wider community um, benefit was evidenced through our children moving their artifacts, so their creative pieces between their home and their school, through expo attendance, which were really highly attended, and community partner support. So now I'd like to switch to the next slide and just talk a little bit about some of our learnings. So we've felt to be in a little bit of a holding pattern since about December 2019. Um, we haven't been able to secure as much funding as we'd like. We have applied for 21 grants and only been awarded sort of five grants. Um, and we have had um, approached our Department of Education and Department of Health to work more closely um, with them in partnership. Um, and some of these attempts haven't been as successful as we'd like. And I'm reflecting on a comment that was made earlier in the um, opening address. 
and maybe it's timing um, and maybe it's about us lobbying harder and helping government to appreciate the importance of the three P's um, and especially um, the non-communicable diseases and the impact they're having and the importance of health promotion and health prevention um, in earlier in the life course. So the 10 key recommendations from our research that I'd like to share with you today are firstly funding. So we're moving to a more flexible um, or more sustainable funding model through um, looking to set up a social enterprise. We also are looking at train the trainer models so that supports the scalability through um, masterclasses and manuals for our schools and our teachers. We also are reviewing um, and looking to streamline our ethics and consent process um, so that it reduces the burden on teachers and parents. Um, we'd be really keen to explore some work to develop a tool specific for um, checking the health literacy responsiveness of schools. The tools that exist um, to use in health and community organisations are fine, but they miss the context of a school environment. And then we'd like to interview our children um, during and after the artefact development so we can gain some greater insight into those health literacy assets and how they develop those um, and, and better understand what's required in the learning process associated with health literacy development. Um, our teachers' um, professional development um, work it really highlighted to us that we need to address both content and pedagogy. So we shouldn't just assume by providing teachers with content um, that they'll then be able to teach health literacy. Uh, and also the importance of engaging parents at the commencement of a program um, and throughout the program. The other thing that we do with our schools is we develop a school-wide action plan and we're very keen to streamline that further so that they can implement mm -hmm. it into their policy. And then finally, um, to build a portal and rationalise the, the data collection. Uh, so, so what's next? Um, One minute. Yeah. Okay. Yep, so what's next? Um, so the point I'd like to make is we want to continue um, this important research with children um, on children's health literacy. We have a, a social enterprise, so Health Lit for All. Um, do you mind changing the slide for me? Um, and so the, the, the social enterprise looks to support the sustainability and scalability agenda. And in, within that, we will have products such as Health Lit for Kids, Health Lit for Teens and Health Lit for Under Fives. We have a number of PhD candidates contributing to this agenda. And finally, in 2020 and 2023, um, I um, am working on an international book project entitled Global, Global Perspectives on Children's Health Literacy, the Intersections Between Health, Education and Community. Um, there's 56 co-authors internationally, many of uh, those people who are currently on the line. And they I'll be coming to visit um, as many of you in Europe in August 2023. So if you're interested in meeting up while I'm there, please email or message me. And thanks again for having me to share um, our program with you. Thank you very much, Rosie, and uh, great to have you from uh, uh, Tasmania. But uh, I'm afraid we, we need to move on now. But uh, it's been great to hear that uh, presentation and that uh, obvious commitment you've got to the health of young people in uh, in your part of the world. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Yvette now for the next section. Yes. Of the meeting. yes, yes, indeed, John and all others. We just heard and seen inspiring good practice examples, and I'm really eager to hear the country case presentations, youth engagement and health policy by Dina R. Zimmerman, Director of the Maternal, Child and Adolescent Health from the Department of Public Health Services, Ministry of Health, Israel. Dina? Okay, thank you. If you could please put on the slides. Um, first of all, I want to thank you very much for this invitation and a chance to focus on our future, both the future of public health and the actual future, which is our children. Um, next slide, please. Okay, in order to just put what I'm saying a little bit in content, um, Israel has a population of 9.5 million um, that is growing at a very large rate and is definitely a place in which we need to focus on children. 
because our population under the age of 14 is 28%. And if we take it under 18, that's about a third of our population. We also have a number of challenges or things that we have to take into consideration um, because we have both a Jewish population, Arab population, other populations, which means that there is more than one language that needs to be dealt with in anything that we are considering on um, a national level. Next slide, please. The, the good news is that we actually have a number of platforms in which um, things can be taking place. First of all, we have a national system of maternal and child health clinics, which takes care of the public and preventive health of children up to the age of six. And it's meant to be not only for immunizations and, and interventions of that sort, but also is very much one of the platforms in which can we can do a lot of health education, both with children and with parents. There's also a national school health service. And not everything, though, should be left in the hands of the Ministry of Health. And one of the nice things that has been happening over the last couple of years is building interministerial platforms. Um, the main one that focused it is health is something that is called F Shari Bari, which translates as healthy as possible. It includes the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Sport, and having this interministerial outlook on how we deal with children and youth has really allowed for a number of things to progress over the number of the last couple of years. Um, first of all, we have a concept called the Health Promoting Schools. These are over 100 schools at this point, and the hope is to grow over the next year. A new call for proposals has recently been put out to bring more schools into um, this circle. And these are schools where the issue of health is even more than the regular curriculum put into the curriculum. It includes a number of ways of um, engaging also the parent body um, in the way that was described in the last presentation. So this is a really good platform on which one can keep on thinking about issues of health and um, health promotion. A similar program exists also in the preschool system. These are known as preschools of the future. And part of the kinds of programs that have been implemented in these kinds of preschools includes taking issues such as sustainability, having the children being involved in growing gardens in the preschool yard and things of that sort to be able them to understand issues such as you know, global health, global warming, from the youngest age um, possible. Um, one of the things that is happening just tomorrow, because as part of getting youth involved, we, we want them not only to be hearing what we have to tell them, but also to learn from them and see perhaps what they could tell us. And for that purpose, um, a number of hackathons have been designed. Tomorrow is the first one that has been dedicated to health. Over 100 schools from all sectors of the country and all languages are participating in the hackathon tomorrow with the hopes that perhaps some of these children will give us some ideas of how to um, progress to, to the future. Now, all of this platform doesn't mean that we're not without challenges. Um, corona has, on the one hand, definitely given all the health challenges as it is given to the rest of the world. But I think in some ways it also gave us a bit of an opportunity. Um, we, there were times that there were discussions with students, with youth about the implications of the various restrictions on schools on them and trying to get some input from them how perhaps to, to deal with it. Um, there has been a lot of use of learning what can be done distance with all the disadvantage of distance learning. There's also 
it completely changed our education system in terms of the platforms available, which hopefully now will be used for the right purpose. But it also gave us a new challenge and that is the issue of like a fake news. Yeah, one, and one I minute, think- yeah, One minute, thank you. Yes, I'm finishing now. Um, the, I think the message that we're taking away from this, tying it into the issue of health literacy is the importance that part of health literacy includes media health literacy. And the media health literacy model is something that's definitely been studied here in Israel. And the idea now is how to put the future of humanity, our children, together with the future of technology um, and provide them with the skills that they need to do so. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dina, really for absolutely inspiring uh, case country presentation. And now I would like to invite our next speaker, Brian Lee Han Wong, Youth Officer, the Lancet and Financial Times Commission on Governing Health Futures 2030. Very exciting position, Han. And he will introduce us into the future outlook, Governing Health Futures 2030, growing up in a digital world. Tell us, how is it? Hi, Veta, thanks. Um, could I get my slides up, please? Um, so I was going to start my intervention with a short video in which you know youth did call on policymakers to harness the potential of the you know digital generation and involve them in the creation of better health futures. But in the interest of time, I'll just drop a link in the chat and let you watch that in your own time and, and move on with uh, with my intervention. Um, so some can I can we have the next slide, please? Next one. So some quick context about the commission. We, we set out to engage with societal and governance questions that emerge at this interface of digital and health transformations to explore the convergence of universal health coverage with digital health, AI, and other emerging technologies. Um, and, and we were really bold and wanted to focus on changing this narrative around digital health to set a, a new vision for governing health features that would remain uh, relevant no matter what digital transformations awaited us. Um, our report, as you see on the screen, which we launched last year, calls for a rethink on harnessing the power of digital technologies for our future health and sets a new approach to digital transformations that promote equitable, affordable, and universal improvements to health. Mindful of how dense Lancet Commission reports are, we've also launched a, a youth edition uh, of our, our report to make our findings and recommendations a bit more digestible. Um, next slide, please. So here's a summary of our key findings. Uh, given the theme of today on, on health and healthy literate youth, you know, I, I'd like to focus uh, our findings and recommendations that, are, that were focused on digital health literacy and, and youth. So today's youth, as we know, are growing up in an increasingly digital world with 70% of all youth globally being connected to the internet. Yet not all youth have the civic and digital literacy skills necessary to effectively navigate and understand these intricate complexities uh, of the digital environments that they are immersing themselves in. Moreover, due to digital divides uh, and underlying socio-politico and economic factors, not all youth are necessarily afforded opportunities to be engaged with digital transformations that are constantly taking place around them. In our work, uh, next slide, please. In our work, we identified that you know, young people growing up in a digital world are experiencing di the extremes of digital connectivity. Both between and within countries, young people's experiences of digital transformations uh, are extremely diverse depending on their levels of digital access uh, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Some are digitally consumed and are vulnerable to online harms and many are digitally excluded, which affects their access to education and employment as well as uh, health information and services. Next slide. But we found, next slide, please. But we found that young people are really excited about the benefits of digital transformations will have for their health and well being and are concerned about the risks. Um, and despite being uniquely equipped to shape positive health futures, young people's views and needs are never, are almost never prioritized in policy development or technology development. So, as such, moving forward, children and young people must be at the center of digital health and governance approaches. So, seeing these issues of digital transformations and health through young people's eyes really influenced the work of the commission uh, and it made us more determined to develop future recommendations for governance approaches which are mission oriented uh, and grounded in core values. I had the pleasure of leading a group of youth to co-author a youth statement and a call for action uh, in which we set out to um, you know say what we wanted to see in the future of health governance. So as you see on the screen these were strong and inclusive health governance uh, 
a human rights-based approach to governing health futures, as well as increased investment in fostering digital skills, education, and innovation so that all youth have digital access capacities and skills to benefit from and contribute as assets of future health systems. So if we can create you know, digital environments and governance mechanisms that work for children and youth, everyone will benefit. Next slide. We had the pleasure of uh, conducting a consultation with 35 uh, participants representing 23 global youth networks uh, in our consultation processes. And this aimed to hear from youth as to how they identified as a group to, to understand their main concerns and proposed uh, solutions with respect to digital transformations in health, uh, as well as to provide a space for our commissioners to hear from youth uh, on the types of health features that they wanted. I'll drop a link in the chat later where you can read the youth statement and call for action in your own time. Next slide. And I'll just end my intervention. Uh, next slide again. Um, I'll just end my intervention by re-emphasizing that, you know, digital health and civic literacy are really fundamental enablers of digital health citizenship. So um, I'll invite any youth who are tuning in to our, uh, into this session now to, to join our Youth for Health Futures Network, and I'll, and I'll drop all the links in the chat um, shortly. Uh, next slide. Again, one more, sorry. <laughs> uh, and I'll invite you to follow us on, on social media, and, and you can check out our, our, our work on our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Indeed, very inspiring and very interesting. So I'm sure it will be of great interest also to Anna Aldona, the president of the digital health section of the UFA section of digital health, who is here today with us. And again, back to John, over to you. Thank you, Iveta. And uh, now we've got those uh, reflections from our uh, uh, young professionals uh, in ASFA and UFA. And, uh, uh, I'm going to go first to Inez, uh, Inez Seatman is coordinator for the ASFA Young Professionals Group and uh, she's very kindly agreed to shorten her presentation. Yes, okay. hello everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm going to give you a really quick whistle stop tour on what I've been thinking about throughout this. And so I really want to thank all of the interventions that have brought up how the importance of treating youth as an asset and bringing them together by both listening to them and then acting on those actions. And so within the Ask for Young Professionals group, we've been doing a lot of research on this and trying to think about what are the barriers right now to getting youth engaged and what are the barriers to also them getting young people involved in public health? Because I think the key underlying point that I want to make is that to be able to do this work and to be able to do this work well, we need to have a representative public health workforce. And that needs to include youth in the same way as all of these actions that we're trying to do. And so to look at that, we need to look at a lot of these topics that we're talking about on a broader scale, also within our workforce itself and see how we can have a really sustainable and consistent public health. So we, we've highlighted that throughout the pandemic. We need to make sure we're not tokenizing. We need to make public health also on the entry level a more accessible field that has more clear opportunities for mentorship and looking at how we can prevent a loss of workforce and representation that then enhances the systematic changes. And we see public health, I think, trying to actively address this through events like these, through having young people here and present and our voices being considered throughout. So I want to thank everyone for that and say that it's you know, a lot of things that ASPR is trying to address through accessible curricula, through having really reactive and proactive educational topics integrated, making sure that we have accessible publications, not just focused on additional journal article publications and having this attempts at creating spaces for youth that value their time and energy and don't just assume it's something that can be given and valuing their their contributions on the same level that you would an expert in something else and that we are an expert in that experience. And with that, I will already pass it on and just ask that this is something that we keep in mind throughout, that our, our workforce can only do work as good as what we represent. Thank you for that, uh, Inez. And uh, I'm sure the uh, aspirations that you have are shared by you for an ASFA in, in what we are doing and demonstrated, I hope, in this uh, uh, session today. Uh, and now I'd like to go to uh, uh, Monica Brinzach in uh, Cluj, 
Uh, welcome to you and uh, uh, just for a few comments please on how you see the future of public health for young professionals. You weren't muted. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I feel so honored to be here and to speak after all these uh, experts and incredible people. I'm here with a double hat. I'm also representing the child and adolescent public health section and UFANEX. Both uh, sections and both uh, parts are very much involved in uh, improving and trying to promote uh, youth and involvement and child involvement across the life course. Uh, can you go please to the next slide? Uh, Professor Sonia Saxena kindly uh, prepared this um, slide and we have, uh, they have uh, three direction early years where they study pandemic impacts on child, children, they monitor health determinants, and they try to strengthen the environmental policy and to tackle the disadvantages from the early rise life alongside reducing air pollution. And then we have the health in schools, where it's very important to analyze the school pandemic recovery plans, to make sure that everyone is involved, uh, and to evaluate the cost of school-based interventions, to co-produce tools for uh, monitoring health in schools, and to increase the digital health competences. And then we have the last but not final part, the adolescent and young people where it is very important to strengthen youth participation, to involve adolescents and young people into, this, into the decision-making process to improve the data on youth mental health, as it has been mentioned numerous times during uh, today's kickoff meeting, and then uh, to improve the access to the mental health support and to reduce poverty. And now if we could go to the UFANEX slides, that would be great. Um, I'm here as well as UFANEX, and UFANEX as the young generation of UFA is trying to, uh, as much as possible, to match the efforts that UFA is doing for the young people. And we have uh, three important pillars that we've been working on in the past three years and that being engagement and involvement, advocacy and training and education. And just uh, for the sake of time, I will try to go briefly and very quickly uh, over everything. Uh, for our engagement and involvement, we're having the fellowship program during the conference. We are um, having the abstract mentoring program where we're helping people to submit abstracts for the conference. And we're organizing workshops together and for uh, young people, and of course, we have the European Public Health Week, where we're organizing several events. Then we have advocacy, where we're organizing events for and with young people. We're sharing and exchanging interests uh, and uh, experiences on research and teaching and policies in public health, and we're doing many partnerships with other youth organizations. And then we have the last category, the training and education, where we have internships that we're offering. We have the tutoring program that we will launch soon, and we have the mental sessions during the European Public Health Week, uh, the European Public Health Conference. Uh, and we're having these two directions that we're exchanging uh, knowledge from senior to young people and where we are giving uh, young people real life experiences. Uh, I'd love to develop more on this, but you can contact me if you need further detail. Thank you and have a great European Public Health Week. Thank you very much, Monica and Inez. Um, I'm just going to say there, uh, what I usually say, that uh, the future's bright, the future's public health, um, and the future of our young professionals uh, is something we all need to uh, commit to uh, very firmly and clearly. We need a professionalised public health workforce, we need a strengthened workforce, and we'll be working through the uh, lessons of the pandemic with in international treaties and so on. Um, to strengthen that position of public health. Um, the, uh, we've heard about uh, the preparedness agenda. We've also heard about mental health. Uh, and we've also heard about uh, inequality uh, and inequality impacts on young people uh, more extremely perhaps than uh, for many other uh, age, age groups. Um, and uh, we have to address inequality of opportunity for our uh, younger generations. Um, so um, without any further ado, I'd say my thank you on behalf of ASFA and hand to Iveta to uh, make uh, final comments uh, and uh, close the meeting. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Iveta. Thank great you very question. much, John. Thank you.
I'm sure, John, you will agree with me that we could not have imagined a better introduction into the European Public Health League. I'm really grateful to you, John, my co-chair and president of the ASPER. And also, I'm really grateful to the main partners of the European Public Health League, the WHO Europe and the European Commission, who were involved not only today, but also during the preparatory period. I would like to thank all other partners, main partners for the days. And I'm also, on behalf of IFA, just wishing you a very wonderful European Public Health Week. 